to Hillside Community Church's Sunday morning service for February the 7th, 2021. We've finished our sermon series in the book of First Peter, and I've been asking the Lord, you know, where He wants us to go next, and I, I really have a piece in my heart about continuing on into Second Peter. So would you bow with me in prayer this morning as we, uh, we just ask the Lord's blessing upon today? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to encourage one another through your word. And uh, Father, I just pray that as people are listening to this um, broadcast this morning, that you would just minister to the needs. There are, there are many needs out there, Lord. And there's many people who are feeling, um, I don't know, God, they're just feeling uh, stressed or maybe downhearted. And, and I just pray, God, that you would you would share with them uh, just a ray of sunshine through your word today, that they would understand how great of a calling that we've been given as believers in you. For those that don't know you this morning, God, and they're tuning into this broadcast, I pray that today would be a day where they recognize that you are God and that you love them and that you are extending your arm out to them and asking them to come and that they would believe, Lord, and, and be saved. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Second Peter was addressed to the same group of churches in Asia Minor as uh, Peter's first letter. And being in Rome, Peter knew that he didn't have very long to live. So this letter acts as Peter's farewell speech to the churches that he had connection with. In, in his first letter, um, Satan is seen and portrayed as a roaring lion, because the theme of much of what we went through in First Peter was fiery persecution coming against the saints from the outside. But in, in Peter's second letter, um, Satan is portrayed more of as a deceiver, as a sneaky deceiver seeking to lead the saints away from the truth into um, false ideas. Now, to start off this letter, uh, Peter gives the believers a final challenge to never stop growing in the Lord, followed by two warnings about corrupted Christian teachers which had infiltrated the ranks of believers and uh, were contrary to the teachings of the apostles, and they are causing much damage to the church. The Apostle Peter's firm conviction is that God loves this world and he's determined to rescue it through Jesus. This means that the evil and the injustice must be confronted and dealt with in the Lord's perfect timing, which will open a new future for all of humanity. And the second book of Peter has a wide, expansive vision of hope for the whole world, and it challenges us to examine our everyday lives. You see, the churches in Asia Minor were not just struggling with persecution and suffering addressed in Peter's first letter. They also had discord and controversies within their ranks, and Peter wanted to stem the tide of heresy and false teaching amongst these believers. You know, he, there was this urgency, like he knew that his time was short. And, and this is actually a real good indication that the apostolic foundation for the future of the church was nearly complete and nearly laid out. And Peter's theme in the second letter is a simple one. It's the overall theme of this letter is to pursue spiritual maturity through the word of God as a remedy to false teaching. You see, nothing really tells us the truth like the word of God. You know, that God reveals himself in the truth um, of his creation. And, um, and there's, you know, basic scientific truth that you can test in a bottle, in a, in a lab. But the truth of God's word on how we should live our lives, we can't understate that. And we need to use the word of God as our roadmap for absolutely everything we do. And presently, in our age, it's so important for us to be connected uh, with the Word of God in its proper 
context so that we can live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God and in a way that uh, makes a mark on eternity. So, my prayer over the coming weeks as we explore this book is that God will illuminate you along the way and that you're going to grow stronger in Christ together with me as we learn together. And this being the case, let's let's start. Uh, please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 1, and I'll be my text this morning is the first four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, have received a precious faith such as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. When we look at Peter, Peter knew Jesus almost better than anyone. He had walked with Jesus. He had sat down under Jesus' ministry. He had seen the miracles that Jesus performed. Simon was Peter's original name, son of Jonah. He saw everything firsthand that it convinced him that Jesus was the promised Messiah of Israel. Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, which actually is Little Rock. And then Jesus told Peter, referring to himself as the chief cornerstone, that on this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter beheld the glory of God as Jesus performed his miracles. He raised the dead. He healed the blind eyes. He cleansed the lepers. He beheld the glory of God on the mountain of transfiguration where the person of Jesus was unveiled and he saw him in the majesty and the glory of who his exalted person was. Um, Peter had come to see Jesus. And as a matter of fact, he was the first of the apostles to proclaim that Jesus was um, the Son of God. And, uh, you know, although Peter knew it in his head, Peter had also to come to terms with his own weakness as a sinful being. Um, He experienced the grace and forgiveness of Jesus firsthand. We see after his crucifixion, Uh, where Peter denied that he even knew Jesus, but he was restored by the Lord. He He was commissioned by the Lord. When Jesus appeared to him and the other disciples, the 11 disciples together, after the resurrection, um, Peter was there, and he beheld his risen Lord. And that's where Jesus restored Peter and asked Peter if he loved him and that he was supposed to feed his sheep. So Peter is dispensing the, uh, the ministry that Jesus had called him to feed his lambs. And we as, as believers in the 21st century, we can benefit from this food, the spiritual food that, that Peter dispensed in obedience to the Lord Jesus. You see, Peter came to life spiritually after Jesus rose from the dead and he met the disciples after when they were together. He appeared to them and he showed them the holes in his hands or in his wrists and his feet. and He saw the holes there. And and Jesus was there with those apostles and he commissioned them right there. And he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit right there. John chapter 20, 20 records this. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also 
I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. See, that was the moment of salvation. That was the moment where the atoning blood of the Lamb was applied to the doorposts of the heart of the first believers in that room together. Because Jesus had overcome death in the grave. He had risen from the grave. And he appeared to them and he commissioned them. And he said, I'm alive. And I want you to take this message that I've given you. And I'm going to give you what you need to, to, to do what I've asked you to do. And I have not just, I have not just died for, for your sins to be forgiven. But I've died so, so that you could be cleansed on the inside. And that you could become the living temple of the Holy Spirit. Peter was there with the eleven. And, and Peter became the leader of the New Testament church. One of the foundation stones of the spiritual building that rises up from the ground as a place where God is to be worshipped. Peter gives instructions to the church in his final letter to them, sharing his thoughts with them on how they ought to live their lives, warning them of the evils coming. The careful way that Peter seeks to help and guide the believers um, to whom he is writing uh, for the second time shows that he is not looking for any additional continuation to the apostolic authority that he's given. He's giving them his final address. He's giving them the meat and potatoes of what they need to be um, servants of the Most High God and to advance the Kingdom of God wherever they go. In in verse 1 of chapter 1, Peter is careful to give glory to Jesus for the salvation that's been given, of which he is an apostle. He was also there to bear witness to them to the life-changing power of the Spirit when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were baptized in the Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, which empowered them for service in the kingdom of God. And Peter himself was there that day, and he preached to the crowd, and over 3,000 of them at the, uh, at the gateway to the temple were saved on that first day. And the church was, had blossomed. And uh, G- Jesus is ascribed as the the author and perfecter of Peter's faith. He clearly ascribes to Jesus the position that Jesus Christ is due. He calls Jesus his God and his Savior. And he tells the church that Jesus is the foundation of the faith that he calls precious. As a matter of fact, Peter was very fond of the word precious. In addition to calling the faith that had been granted precious... He refers to the blood of Christ as precious. He refers to the saints as precious. Peter used this word often in his writings. Our faith is precious because before a sinner comes to salvation, a sinner's will is swallowed up in the will of Satan. After a person comes to Jesus and is saved from the darkness and granted sainthood, the believer's will is swallowed up in the sweet will of God. The sinner is bound to Satan in shackles, which only death can break unless intervention is had through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In the case of the believing sinner whom the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to, this new person, this born-again person that's filled with the Spirit of God, that's given the Holy Spirit, this person has a new identification with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death on the cross who has broken the shackles of sin that had bound him to the prince of darkness. Aren't you glad that as believers in Christ the chains have been broken? We no longer are slaves to sin. We have a choice to push away from the table of iniquity and to follow Christ wholeheartedly. Now the believer is bound to Jesus Christ with heavenly shackles that only death can break. Now, this is why Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 11, 28 and 30 to 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. (laughs) You see, when we come to that final time before the Lord, 
when we draw our last breath or when we are raptured in heaven. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Uh, We will be free, free at last, for all of eternity, to be everything that God has designed us to be from the very beginning. We will walk with Him, we will talk with Him, we will have sweet fellowship with one another, and sin, death, and the grave will be banished forever, and we'll live in the paradise of God forever and ever and give Him praise. And He will be our Father, and we will be His children. Until that day, Jesus says, Come to me. My shackles on you are light. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You see, everybody serves somebody. You either serve God or you serve the kingdom of darkness. There's no in the middle. You can't serve God and the kingdom of darkness. You're either a child of God or you're a child of darkness. But Jesus calls today and he says, Come to me, those of you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will free you from the shackles of sin and of death. I will free you both here and now and and leading into all of eternity. You see, to Peter, the faith given to him through the power of the resurrected Savior was precious. The grace given to the saint by the Lord Jesus Christ is significant. The peace offered by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God is also significant. Not only is God's grace and peace given to the believer at the time of salvation, but it is also given to the believer as he or she journeys through life going forward to that final day when we see Jesus face to face in eternity. Peter's prayer for the saints in the church as he's looking forward and he's seeing that his own death is near, he's praying for the saints in the church that the same grace that saved them and gave them peace with God when the Lord saved them from darkness would be given to them in abundance as they continue living and growing in their knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, their Lord. In verse 3 of our text, Peter reminds the saints of the spiritual power that God gives to those who believe. Overcoming power. He says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly night life through our Lord or knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. You see, it wasn't like we initiated anything. But God loved us first. And He called us out of darkness by His grace, by His, by his mercy into His glorious light. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 is clear about this principle when the Apostle John speaks and he says this, This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And love consists in this, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent us His Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. A spirit-filled believer serves his Lord with an abandon that says, nothing matters about me so long as the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in me. Everything has been supplied by God. Everything has been supplied to grow deep and strong in the Lord, rooted in Him. Peter emphasizes that God, by His own glory and goodness, desires that his saints come to know him in the power of his resurrection more and more as they sojourn through life that has been given to them. So many saints, it seems, are content just to wade in the shallows of knowing God, continuing their daily walk as a spiritual pygmy, only lightly experiencing God's heavenly knowledge. But God has opened the storehouses. Peter is trying to say this. He's opened the storehouses and He has invited us to so much more. There is such a vast and a rich storehouse of the depth of His saving grace and the knowledge of that to be feasted upon. If only the saints would recognize this rich banquet for what it is and feast upon it. The saints would grow strong and transform from pygmy warriors into giants of the faith. To the glory of Jesus. Nothing, my friends, nothing has been withheld. God has given you everything you need to live a godly life and to be overcomers in this life. 
God's given us everything we need. We just need to take the Lord at his word and believe. Peter and the other apostles desired that the church would hunger and thirst to know the living God and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. When you hunger and thirst for the Lord of all creation, for the righteousness of God, He will fill you. He will not turn you away. We don't have to live in the shallows. We don't have to be pygmy warriors any longer. We can be strong in the Lord and giants in the faith as God gives us His grace because He's provided these provisions and He's calling us to this. Rise, church. Rise and see what God has called you to and live as God has called you to live. Paul exemplified what Peter was trying to tell the people. The death of Jesus on the cross was the single most important act in human history. Without Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we would have no lasting hope of any kind. For the Apostle Paul, like other writers in the New Testament, the cross of Christ represented salvation itself. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. See, Paul was excited about proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, hanging on a cross and resurrected from the dead, triumphing over sin, death, and the grave. The message of the cross was the power and wisdom of God. It says this in 1 Corinthians 1.24. Now we all know the story of Paul, or if you've never heard of this before, it's worth looking at and ask. You see, Paul hadn't always viewed Jesus Christ's death in the manner in which he was speaking that I just read to you. Originally, Paul was named Saul, and he had once been antagonistic to Jesus Christ's way. To be plain about it, Paul had been insolent, self-righteous, religious, and bigoted. Years later, in one of his letters to the church at Corinth, Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But God intervened in this man's life. And so he can intervene in everyone else's life in the same manner as it was exemplified in Paul. The apostles Peter, John, and Paul all had the same message to give to the churches concerning the gospel which had been entrusted to them as a foundation for future generations, leading all the way to us, who are the spiritual great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren of these apostles. Through the revelation of his word, God has given the saints every provision that they need to live a life that is pleasing to him. No, you can't please the Lord in your flesh. You can't please him in your own effort. But when you yield to the spirit of God which has been provided to you, Because Jesus made the way through the atoning sacrifice that he gave on the cross. When you realize this, you can live in a way that is pleasing to God. This is what Peter is telling us. Peter tells us in the fourth verses of our text saying, Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. You see, God's desire is that through knowing Him and the promises that have been given to us, that our love for Him would be such that we desire to please Him and that our heart's cry would lead us into living a life of holiness even as He is holy. You see, Jesus wants us to participate in the divine nature. This isn't meaning that He wants us to be our own little gods. What it means is is that Jesus wants us to become imitators of him, surrendered in everything that we are and everything that we have to his control. The name Christian is often marred by this religious spirit that has very little to do with its original meaning. Christian was originally derived to mean Christ-like one. It is written in Leviticus chapter 20, 26. You are to be holy towards me because I, the Lord, am holy. I have separated you 
from among the people to be mine. And he said that to the Israelites. And we are grafted into the root of the patriarchs. And he has called his church to be separate. And to be holy even as he is holy. See, this is, this is where Peter wants us to go. He's given us every provision to be able to live a God life, a godly life. Do you see? When we truly connect with God and His holiness, everything changes. Our heart's desires begin to change as well. Rather than desiring to satiate and follow our fleshly desires with sin, our hearts are pulled magnetically by the Holy Spirit to draw closer to Him. And the more that we come to see Jesus for who He truly is, the more that we love Him. And the more that we love Him as our Heavenly Father, the more we long to be like Him. This is why Jesus said in John 14, 15, and 16, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to be with you forever. My friends, I've talked with... I once talked with another spiritual leader, another, another leader in the church. And, and when I started talking about freedom in Christ to be holy and live holy, he was like, what are you talking about? We're never going to be that. We're sinners. We're never going to be that. And I'm like, my, my friend, stop. See, the provision that's been given to you by the blood of the Lamb it's a provision not only for, for washing, but a provision for sanctification and changing to be like Jesus, to be holy. We can't be holy on our, on our own steam. We can't. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why it says in Galatians, if we walk in step with the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the sin nature. God desires that His, His bride be holy in what they do. Follow Him and seek Him through the believing of the precious promises of God. Jesus has given us everything we need in His presence to bring His Word. We read the Bible, but the Word without the Spirit is dead. When the Holy Spirit comes in and He illuminates the Word of God, He enables us to feast upon it. And He enables us to grow. And He enables us to be imitators of Christ as His dearly loved children. That's what this world needs to see. The world doesn't need just to see this. The world needs to see this combined with an action where we step out of our comfort zone, where we lose this mentality of self-centeredness and we see the world through God's eyes and we see that God has commissioned us to go into the world and preach the gospel. Preach it with our mouth, but also preach it with our lifestyle. As James says, faith without works is dead. God desires us to be holy, to be filled with His Spirit, to be obedient, to be ambassadors of the righteousness of God in Christ. We participate in the divine nature of God, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Being born again, God wants to change your hearts. You don't have to, to, to sit in the seat of disobedience. You can be free to be holy. Peter wants the church to understand the gravity of this truth and to embrace the freedom that this truth brings. Freedom from the shackles of sin. Freedom to live under the yoke of Christ in obedience to Him. Freedom to live in all the abundance that God has designed. Freedom that leads God's children to eternal life in the presence of our Savior. And this, my friends, is the introduction to Peter's letter. He wants us to see this. Oh, God is so good. Let's pray. Jesus, we long to be walking in step with you, O oh Lord. You've given us everything we need. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins and, and for overcoming sin in the grave through your resurrection. 
Lord, the power of death has been overcome. You are the resurrection and the life. And you called us, O God, out of darkness to come become children of the light. You've given us the provisions. You've broken our shackles. Help us to be obedient and to hunger and thirst after you, O God. God, we know that hungering and thirsting for righteousness comes before anything else. And when we do that, Lord, you will fill us and our relationship with you, with you will grow in love and your love will spur us on to be obedient children. God, forgive us for our apathy. Forgive us for dwelling in the shallows. Help us to dive deeper into you and to understand more clearly and more richly what you called us to as your children. Protect those out there in the church today that have been attacked. Help them, Lord, to have your wisdom and your protection. And for those that don't know you, God, I pray that they would give their life to you today. For the Lord says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and has risen from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that he is your Savior, you will be saved. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name.